This conference will now be recorded. Okay, we have a packed agenda for today. Um, we do have a list of things I'm hoping we get to really quick before the main event starts. Brad, I'm going to put you off to the lead one because you could you could be our longest one. But Kimball, do you want to start with the internship? Sure. Right. Just a quick overview of what you're talking about. Certainly. Um, so I run for about four weeks, about two hours a day. Brad has participated in it for many years, I think about four. So I had one request, and there were a few questions that I should be an email, but if anyone else has any questions. This is where we have gotten some of our, our line of the now workforce, correct? Right? I think Brad hired three employees out of the company. <coughs> Is this a paid internship? No. No. It's more a work study. I just kind of copy what they told them before. So am I good to sign that? Yeah, you know, I, I think we'll just have to approve that at the at our board meeting on Monday. He just needs it for tomorrow. So anyone who's got any complaints is Peter joined us. Okay, yeah, I don't think he had any complaints either. Sure. Go ahead. All right. Well, I have a few make it official on Monday. Okay, make it official. But sorry. Jason, you didn't have any problems with the, uh, the OC work internship? No, no, no. Okay. Good. Okay. okay. The answer, the answer my question. Good. Okay, and then item number three is the um, Hartley Davison on staff parade around the lake. I don't know if you wanted to say anything on that, Bill. I think it's, it's just one trip around. Apparently, it's one trip around the lake. You know, what? Shape Main Street will be at that point. I have no idea. But uh, they want to leave from uh, what is it? The Hampton. Hampton Inn, go around the lake once. So it shouldn't be much of a traffic direction. 40 to 50 bikes is what I understand. Okay. Unless the visitors here or Roost has any additional information. I have no information at all. You're not going to be out there in a bike. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, well, that, that'll be something we'll bring to the board. So, if you, unless you have any questions now, we'll. Okay. Um, Bill Dillon. He's on TV. Uh, Bill, is, uh, is there anything that you want to add to the, the mix and tell us what's going on with the stewardship on Mirror Lake? Hi. Right. Uh, <clears throat> well, it's basically going to be on the weekends, 10 hours a day, 7 30 to think to 6. Um, and the aim is to actually get some data so we kind of find out where uh, the boats are coming from um, to inspect the boats. This is not going to be an aggressive type of program, uh, but it is going to be trying to collect data so we can figure out um, an, an excess. What I mean for a state. What's that? So we can assess the. Uh, um uh the impact or lack of impact of invasive species to see if there's anything that we knew we need to do um to protect the lake further for the invasive species um and the stewards are the same as the stewards that are uh at the uh state boat launch site it's the same program <clears throat> okay and if i could just add there bill my understanding with the state boat launch is that they have no legal power. They're really there for an advisory position, and that's what this would be modeled after. Yeah, exactly, exactly right. Okay. Just, uh, there, there isn't anything that uh, they can do if somebody uh, is not cooperative. Um, but we do find that 99% um, of the people that put in over the state boat launch site are cooperative, and most do want to know. So it is informative for them. It'll be informative for us too. Okay, and I think from your, you and I having our conversation earlier, this person will be probably set up over by the gazebo or by the um, tennis courts. And when they see someone coming to put in, just go over and give them literature or inform them. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. Um, 
asked to inspect the boat also um, and um, to make sure that there isn't anything hidden, uh, especially with kayaks. Some of the um, hidden areas in kayaks where you have the bilges where you can store things sometimes can have some invasive species. Okay. Unless you've got more to add, I'd ask the board members at this point, do you have any questions or? Okay. Great. We'll we'll put that on the the agenda for Monday. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, the other issue. Let's go back to number one on the agenda, and that's been an issue that's been brought up. It's an issue that we don't have a good answer to, and we really have to make a decision. Um, I don't have my notes on all the. I had a whole list of pros and cons. I'm not sure if I brought those with me or not, but. What we really need to do is, from what I remember, is if we do decide to allow people to put in heated sidewalks, we pretty much can figure we're not going to have a guarantee on any of the sidewalks by Kaberke that we put in. Once we change what, they won't be the ones putting them in, they'll be, now we'll be changing the base that they have. And that was one of the biggest arguments, if I can remember. Correct. Any, anything you want to add or you'd like to throw out? Yeah, I have a copy of Aztec Geothermals. When they do the comparison, this shows just the heat consumption of what the options they we were looking at when we were talking about completely heating the side off. And at that time, we came to the agreement that it was not something that we wanted to pursue. Uh, it, it's it's a very it, it's a lot of electricity, and when we talk about Kim will look at the electricity, but you you have to give him more information than just we're heating the sidewalk you have to know what we're heating it with and how we were heating it um, there's been a handful of people that have reached out but uh, in the locations that this goes in in the sidewalk since the construction company will not be installing it it will limit their compaction and it will also uh, could adversely affect heaving they will not warranty the areas that this is in so if this becomes an area where you have one that's heated one that's not one that's heated one that's not if it gets if there is a reason for this to uh, cause they will not and I, I mean you can't expect them to we have a similar problem with our drains on main street if i'm not mistaken the the drains are at three feet in the surrounding road is at five and the frost difference, and that's why you always see our drains coming up and have to be readjusted every year. So it is a concern. And I did talk to Kimball about the electric, as he said, there are key times that we would want to have people not. I think yeah. it was like eight to 10 in the morning and five yeah. to seven at night. Yes. And I don't know how you would reg regulate that, but those are the times that it could put us into a higher, out of our hydro allocation. If I got it, would, right. it would put us further out of it, further out. Well, I mean, this was based on every single section of the sidewalk being replaced, being heated, and we found it. I mean, we're under one green infrastructure grant, and I don't know how less green than we are than burning all that electricity up trying to melt snow. Um, so that was one of the main reasons why we went away from this. Also, um, I mean, the calculations he had here, I mean, there was like, Six million six hundred thousand BTU hours over the course of the that would take the heat the complete side. Well, I think we're about uh, it was a couple of years old. We're about eighty percent of our electricity is hydro. There's a twenty percent that are, that would definitely be things about eighty percent. Correct. And the thing is, is like the contractor is concerned. How are we going to coordinate this? How are we? because there's a very limited amount of time when they go through, they put in their uh, liner, they put in their base stone and their layers. The very top layer of stone is where this goes. So there would have to be a time, depending on who's there to say, okay, now it's time to throw this in. We gotta get it done immediately. And then they're coming through because that's, since it wasn't added as part of this contract, I guess we need an answer whether we're gonna move forward and we're gonna pursue this whether we're going to tell everybody um it, it's just we it's too late I don't know what we have to do we just need an answer before it gets 
granted, we're not doing the sidewalk till next year, but we need an answer to get this out there so people can either plan for it or our our fear is that if a lot of people jumped on, how could you do it if not one person was doing the whole contract? If every building had their own plumber up there doing it, how are you going to coordinate 30 plumbers, 30 people working inside? Of, and plus, the other thing is, it appears that every single person that works up there within the state right away will have to have a highway work permit. They cannot work under our highway work permit to do this. So they, every contractor that's up there working will have to reach out to the state and have a highway work permit for working in the right way. I know we'd like to have had an answer a month ago, but give us a drop dead date. You need to know one way or the other, like within the week, within. Yes, we, we, we need to know so we can move forward to get certain people. Okay, at least. And then again, how are we going to, I mean, we're taking a big risk if, if a bunch of people jump on and we have a huge portion of the sidewalk people are not needed. Yes. We have a number of uh, businesses or building owners that are looking into it are, are already through it. Right now, that's all I have. So, smoke signals has to go back in. That was part of this thing because it was pre existing. So, this was there. So, that will go back in. Ricky will be putting that back in. What we're looking at is uh, inconsistencies in the sidewalk where there could be two buildings going together who want it, there's someone who doesn't. Another person who wants it, two buildings who don't, so it could fluctuate. And then on top of that, if there are larger numbers, if they have individual plumbers or installation, how do we maintain that or hold them to some sort of standards or consistent amongst? Well, that, it's not just the standard, it's coordination, coordination. because the contractor is not going to put the brakes on to the way if somebody can't get there. It's going to almost, I just don't see any way that we can. Regular shit. That's that's my whole thing. How we? It's not like right now. We could tell them everybody wants to do it. You go get it in there. We're going over the top of it next year. It can't be. It has to be in the top layer. So you have to have Kubricki come in and do a portion of the work when they go by. Then you have to jump out there and get it in there. Get it into your basement. Get it into the electric boiler. And then we'll come back and finish. So you got like a very small window because the, the subcontractor is going to go through. After Kubricki goes through, they're going to be right behind the lane stone. So you, you've got almost no time mm -hmm. to hold. It. But if it's something we want to pursue, we got to get a letter out. We have to get this all. And uh, so, what is Kubricki not warranting? The the material or the installation? Anything. Anything that has to do with the sidewalk. With the heating, if the heating's in that portion. Can did they anticipate any failure? I mean, you know, can, are they just saying, hey, if you do this? They can't warranty it. How can they warranty it? Because it's not going to be their workmanship in the sidewalk. That's why they will not warranty it because it'll be them putting in work, another person putting in work, and then they finish on top of that. So all they would be responsible for is putting the piece of granite on top of whatever. Yeah, they would be responsible for that. That's part of the contract. But a year from now, something settled or yeah. something was out of whack, we would be on us to fix. Because they will not warranty if it's in this one of these locations, which I is understandable. There. Jack, yes, said the brad where usually what may happen is the heated section won't freeze and that the cold section will freeze and then not the, when there, there'll be heat. So the transition between the real both the heated and the cold is where the building is. And, and we don't we never really had that issue. I just been one that's got the case now, but but if those it's just concrete bricks that are much smaller, these are big slabs. And we're not even sure how it's gonna react with this being instead of like right now that heating is you have like a two inch inch, I think they're two and a quarter inch thick of bricks. And now you're gonna have a three inch slab of granite. And then one or two inches under that, with that. You're, just, you're trying to heat five inches where now you're heating basically two and a quarter. I, I just, I don't know how it's going to work. Okay. Right? May I ask, what we, we vetted this? That's what I mean. But, but what's, now, what's, I mean, what because that, that kind of ties into the number of people we've requested. Because I'm just, what I'm not, I'm unclear as to why we're opening back up this discussion in the sense that 
but there doesn't seem to be an overwhelming desire on behalf of the building owners for that to happen. I just, or maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I just don't. Like we said, we do have three people who would like to do it. We need an answer for them. And if we're going to allow those three people, then we have to open it for everybody. Sure. That becomes the dilemma. Sure. That's that's that's. Did they express their interest during the planning phase that they wanted to do this? But now that they know just in the last opportunity, last two months. Yes. That's that's. We, we remember how we went through this so many times and then we decided we okay, it's out. Thermal, we, went through like yeah, we, we went through it said it's out well when we went through all the planning stage never really was brought back up um i was deflated because i thought this would be one of those ideal state near like medicaid salt and um and, but it didn't seem to work and like i told art as far as from my point unless the whole thing is done it doesn't save me any extra work mm -hmm. So how, how would we handle smoke signals if that go back in it has to but as peter was saying you're going to have a sidewalk adjacent to it that's not heated there's going to be frost heaves possibly possibly and we don't know we're still going to be responsible no for, no that's for Bricky putting that one back in because that's in the contract okay that's a pre-existing condition they know about that this will be on them to reconnect really they're, they're reluctant because we're essentially if we move forward opening this up we're changing the terms of the agreement of the and that's correct. Um, I mean, they don't want to be held up because the plumber didn't show up. No, I know. There were several reasons I could see where it would be not advantageous to open up. And with something like this, you hate to say no, but it's something that we have to either say no or say yes. And then somebody has to raise something to get it out to everybody, give them an absolute deadline date to tell us they want to do it and get their design done because. Are we going to allow more than one kind of system? Are we only going to allow one kind of system, or are they? It's it's just opens up so many. I mean, you know how much we talked about this. <laughs> we beat it to death for like two years. And I, I, maybe as a board, we didn't communicate it to the public as much as we could have. How uh, we well, that, really that's why I brought it. that's why I brought copies of the original thing and everything we went through and. I and other organizations paid all the money to do the study, and basically, I, I don't. Well, it doesn't sound like this is worth doing. I guess that depends on who you talk to. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's well, the three people who want to do it, or do you seems like more problem. liability on us if we move forward with it. So. Because I tried to work with a contractor and tried to figure out how we can make this work and what's brought this. What had so bad is the water line issues with people getting new water lines. The contractor said that they would be able to do it, and then they found out that they cannot they cannot take on separate contracts with every person out there to try to do this. They thought they could, and then their insurance said, No, absolutely way are you doing this? And if you're gonna go with an extra extra with say they're going to work for somebody else up there that's not us, that's a whole separate work permit, that's a whole separate deal. You are not going to run it under the villages if you're working for somebody else. So it turns into a whole, so they backed right out and said they're not doing anything for anybody but the village up there. So, plus it comes down to New York State work permit. So, that's the thing. Anybody that's doing this work up there within the right of way has to get a highway. I think we should sustain them. I agree. Well, we've got, we've we've got a week until whatever. Why don't we let Peter and Mark and Kimball and Brad talk talk it through and that's the sit there with these guys if we do allow we should have a higher rate for people to use them that could be part of the recommendation yeah, and possibly I don't know if it's legal but maybe you find someone that puts them all I never put in one and puts them all in what it really sounds like is this was researched and we couldn't do it two years ago and if we were going to do it we would have had it in this initial plan and had it be an option um i mean obviously i'm one of the buildings who wants to do it because my side the side is seated next to me so it makes sense to continue that but if we're not sure a it's going to work with the added yeah, that, answer, that would be so i think it's the way you present it you say the sidewalk's not going to be warranty we're not sure if it's even going to work if you do put it in it's just not something that and of course in your case it would be not as big a deal because now it's going to be one continuous heated sidewalk. It's only two spots that have 
But like in your case, say anybody that wants to do this is going to have to get somebody to know something about it, put a plan together, right. get a permit started, and make sure. And then you got to coordinate it with them because they can tell you they're going to be at that section of sidewalk in Tuesday, in June, it out to be Friday. or it could be three months off. You know what I mean? Tell the guy three that okay, they're ready, they're going to be there next week, and then have something else happen. And that's why they can't. There's how can you have people just waiting at your building, just waiting to do this? That's my whole problem. Why we say it's not going to work in this scenario. Yeah, and I, again, I want to circle back to uh, maybe as a board, we could have communicated to large. Thoroughly, we looked at it. Because there are, there are some. Currently pushing for and looking through creative ways to do the theater, but just as far as pumping in heat from, from right, yeah. just, like, just really just out of the box ideas, we did everything we could. Ideally, that would be fantastic. Just, um, All right, so I gather the consensus is that it was something we looked into, it was a great idea that didn't work. And I guess if you really want to put the finishing touches on it, is really not going in the direction of saving energy and kind of the planet by yeah. using up our hydro allocation at the street. I, I was just the biggest proponent two years ago. I mean, it's just too much trouble to All of it. It was unanimous from the board. Right, and the thing that would concern me here in like and actually two inches to be through or three inches to be through. I'm not sure if it's going to work or not. It's like a big cast iron rating. That's a, that's a big uh, gamble to make. Then not, it's not laying on sand or anything like that. You're laying on stones because the sidewalk is permeable. So there's a bedding stone layer. So that you're putting these pipes in on top of stone. So I think if that's all written off, it makes sense. I think it's going to make sense that any of the other that wanted this. And it's, it's just not going to work in this scenario. And then I'm one of five. My perspective was, is, and it kind of ties into what you're saying, being consistent throughout, having the same. And if we have room here, one, instead of having it as a whole, yep. you know, everyone combined. And I don't know who here would want to be the one to go to the Main Street merchants and say, we're delaying this job because he did sidewalks. I think everyone would like to have this job done as quickly as we can. And this certainly would delay it. Okay. Um, did, was there anything else to come up other than before we let Greg and George have this floor? I have two quick questions. Okay. We're, we settled on the digger truck, so I think that can be on the agenda for Monday. There's no problems. It's going to be 307000 Okay. Dollars and the hybrid that we talked about last time, the OGS bid ended up saving us seventeen hundred dollars over the um, source well, seventeen hundred dollars between the two of them. Then there's an additional twenty two hundred dollars in nice sort of money. So all together, you know, thirty nine hundred dollars. So are you ready for those? We're ready for those. Yes, but that's still the two EV wrap. Yes. Close the digger and you won't see me again for six months. <laughs> Promise. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's my father said you've gotten to be an expensive date. We won't be here for two years. Yeah. <laughs> order two and a half. If we wait till June, it goes up. Okay. Great. Um, as you all know, the village and town have very tough decision to make on what's going to happen with our events this year. And luckily we have two people, well, four people here that are experts in the field that <coughs> get their own. Um, want to go together? You want one of these start first? I'd like to have Jim and Emily give an overview. Sure. So we'll do that. I mean, that's just a good idea. So we're here, we're here. I'll go ahead. We um, have had many conversations with the town and the town. Uh, 
Supervisor Chair for the Health Department, uh, a thousand percent support is what he said that this is the way we should proceed. We've also run it up the ladder through the control room to the state, and they are very supportive of this and will stand behind it totally. And, um, you know, so we feel pretty confident this is a good direction. There's clearly there's not other communities that are doing it like this, but we think it puts us in the best position for vaccination primarily. Other areas are doing proof of vaccination and also testing, but it's a little more difficult with multi-day and long uh, and some events lasting some visitors coming for longer stays than two or three days uh, where some of the uh, quick testing happens. We do have PCR testing in Saranac Lake. It's limited in number. It's a 48 hour turnaround, so the testing option is difficult. Uh, we've certainly chatted with lacrosse and with George and also with Iron Man at great length uh, over the past couple of days. We think this is, you know, logistically a little difficult, but we think between now and then we can figure out a system that uh, is put in place so that we can guarantee people that are participating at any level on the events are going to have to have proof of vaccination. And we feel that that will really put us in a position community-wise um, and also with the event that it'll be uh, less less restrictive than not having those requirements because the, once you're vaccinated a lot of the you know the protocols change a little bit and they become easier and more manageable um we feel it's probably you know uh the the events will look at it as it's uh very unusual happening right now that anybody would go to that level but after talking with the state and the county we feel very confident that this is the direction to go at this point to gain their support on this event uh, and also help us work with the logistics of it with the two groups that we're primarily concentrating on so that we can have a smooth operation. And we feel that this is the only way we can get these events back to a no, more normal situation. Uh, without having proof of vaccination, it's a whole different story. We feel our community will also feel most confident in doing it this way. So that's in a nutshell. Um, that's what it's been. We've had a lot of discussions with George, Greg, and others at Ironman as well. Um, and Ashley, who is with uh, George's group uh, too. And we feel that this is, uh, it puts us almost in a very good leadership role doing this at this level right now too. We feel other organizations and other areas will sort of mimic us pretty quickly. We did talk to some other destinations that are you know, struggling and, you know, reducing their events um, significantly, you know, for the same reasons that we're concerned, you know, community safety, you know, the community take for um, events in general is you know, there's other challenges we have too, and you know, the 20% reduction is, you know, a combination of other issues as well. Certainly what what we, we all have going on on Main Street affects things. Also, you know, the staff and employee situation, a lot of our businesses and restaurants are probably more difficult than it's ever been. So staffing the community up, we're actually gonna be doing a pretty good outreach starting at the, on Thursday, but the staffing issue was also something we're concerned. 
And it is, you know, we do have to keep in mind the experience of the, you know, people that come to visit here in our region, whether it's for their event or the leisure traveler. The experience is good, they're happy. If it's bad, they share, and they share a lot. So it could have a very negative impact on our region long term if we don't try and manage the, the amount of people coming into the community from the safety perspective as well as from what our community can handle. We also feel we have a responsibility to these two particular groups because they've been a backbone of a lot of activity over the last, in George's case, I think approaching 35 years, George, approaching. Uh, and uh, uh, Ironman is probably appro approaching 25, 23, 23. Um, so we feel that we also have a uh, you know, responsibility to making sure that their event goes as smooth as possible and that we put them in a position where we have uh, we have light path as well. We feel that by having proof of vaccination being the criteria, it puts everybody in a position of more comfort moving forward. Some people will be say where, you know, it's way too much overloaded, but the bottom line is we don't know what the situation will be in August right now. And this puts us in a position where the organizations have plenty of time to let their participants know well in advance. And it puts us in the safest position here in the community. You can buy vaccine cards on the internet. Well, it's perfect. Like, it won't be there's, perfect. There's no such thing. Yeah. You know, certainly the, 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 yeah, the Excelsior Pass that the state has and other ones will certainly be implemented to a certain extent that we move this forward. And uh, those are instant IDs and are confidential. And we feel there's probably room to work with that. The state is encouraged that we're taking, recommending this step, and they will certainly try to uh, help us any way they can through their Excelsior Pass. So does that mean you'll work with Iron Man? And we certainly will because it's 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 putting burden on them as well. So that we feel um yeah, is that what we're gonna do that? Yes, no, no, that's a youth event, so it's not possible to have everybody vaccinated. Yes, you know, so they're what we're thinking for that that's much smaller, that's gonna be 4016 for 56 of 2019. Um, so we're going to be 10 teams smaller, and I think what we're going to focus on there is trying to make sure all the adults that want to attend, if anybody over 18 who wants to attend the event, can show proof of vaccination or a positive or a negative test. It'll be 12, too, and that's definitely going to affect But there will be time. Right. 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 There's no time. August shown, there's no issues. If August is very sensible, the challenge for us is going to be excising 20% out of this. It's going to be painful, yeah. but we're, we're committed to doing it. I think Chief Moore has a way to even form with to get 20% of that. Oh, we, we've been talking about it for sure. Okay. <laughs> we, I need, what I really would like to do um, would be to come back in three weeks or so with a specific plan for the audience based on our ability now to go and shrink that event, move some things out of here. We need some temporary plans for that because my concern is, you know, besides COVID, there's, believe me, events have been operating all around the country very well with this. Right. No breaks whatsoever. I'll be brought to events in all these January. Not one contract race required. So it's safe to do these things, but the concern we have is the community is going to be in a position to accept I think for a legit 32 years. It's, it's a challenging period right now, a lot of fronts. So we don't want to overwhelm the community with demand that can't be satisfied. So we're going to work on the next couple of weeks to officially move some of the elements out of here. Hopefully elements that will be important to this community in terms of what demographic that might be. But we'd like to just try to keep it confidential for a couple of weeks while we make our arrangements, get things tied up, and then when it's announced, we'll deal with it. It's not going to be easy, but uh, we're willing to do it. So George, uh, uh, Jason, and I were just talking. You're going to follow the same protocols as high school across as well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. For the June event, right? Yeah. So we're actually exceeding them. Yeah. Well, so the high school event, the same play with masks. No, no. Yeah, they do. That's not, not, that's not a New York State requirement, though. There's not a New York State nothing like it. I guess, oh, well, I was talking to you, generally the feedback that I received in public calls has been positive. You know, only say the challenge with the uh, earlier in the week, there is a younger demographic that plays. And uh, just like kids that are enthusiastic, they want to get out outdoors, and they and they, and they blanket mainstream. And uh, 
that would be for me and the feedback that I've received would be like the primary challenge. The event itself, I think, would not be as much of a concern. It's the circulation after the fact. Understood. And that would be management of the mask on Main Street. One of the advantages, you know, over the years, we've had conversations with the community about how do we get more people on Main Street. Now we're having <laughs> can we keep them off Main Street. It's a lot of sense on that. But frankly, we can't. One of the advantages of being outdoors in a vast area like that is that it's wide open. There's a lot of room, and so things we don't have any indoor activities proposed. We normally do a, a Legends event every year to recognize individuals who contribute to the event. We normally do that indoors. We did an interval last year at the beautiful facility. We can do that outdoors like we did for 25 years, where it's safer and it can fit easily within the guidelines for groups. Mm -hmm. But you know, there's not going to be any tailgating, we're not going to have any of those things going on. That's all going to be eliminated. Mm -hmm. um, any third party vendors and all those would be subject to all the rules and restrictions regarding uh, you know, testing and so forth. So it's not going to be a very similar year. Our goal is simply to get people back here. Uh, last year was the first year in 32 years we didn't find the cross here. Um, and um, like to get them back and kind of re reinvent going forward. We're committed to working with the community to right size our event mm -hmm. and, and get it to where it's needed most in the community. Mm -hmm. So there's some ideas on some shoulders that we can do some things. Mm -hmm. uh, but we want to do what's in the best interest of the community first, mm -hmm. then we want to survive as a small second. Right. So right. I, I think what we're concerned about, George, or where the it's not testing for August, it's vaccine. Yeah, understood. Um, yes. And that, you know, that's really the, the August event, I think, is the one of more concern. Understood. Than what and that's where we have to, I think we have an opportunity seeing that we have Ironman end of July, a few weeks later, you, that we have a way to work out the system so we can have the system to vaccinate people work seamlessly so yes. we move it around a little bit. And I, you know, I think that's really what we've got to focus on. And it will go public because the town board meeting will be tonight. So we're, we'll be out. Uh, that will normally they have media there. And I think it's important that we let your potential attendees on both groups know that if both the town and the village uh, move forward with some, with this, and the county is already on board with it, um, that we get the word out ASAP so that anybody that's questioning or coming or anybody that hasn't been vaccinated that do want to come, we give them that opportunity. I just want to mention one thing too, when it comes to the June event, we're kind of overlooking it and saying it's not a concern, but I do think that we need to keep top of mind. If there is, which I understand your position is there's not going to be, but if things go south with that event in June, yeah. Iron Man in August is going to be nearly, it's going to be a much, yeah, much heavier list. So I just don't think we should push it aside. Too oh, far. it's not being pushed aside by us, I can assure you, because it falls on my back. So we're going to be sure to follow all the 10 pages of procedures that are required and make sure everybody's healthy and uh, that we identify those that are not going to take the appropriate procedures. But we're talking about right. So we're saying, teams, no. right. And we'll say, the adults will be vaccinated for that June event. Anybody that's old enough in June. Will yeah, I would suggest, I would strongly suggest, we need to think about the timing here because it's only not that many weeks away that the existing protocols may be appropriate for that, that where you provide a negative test, appropriate negative test for your vaccination. Uh, it's a two day event, George, is that correct? It's two and a half. Two and a half. Okay. And then going into the fourth of July. Just kind of time. The initial concern the feedback from the community into Iron Man. Again, the, the event itself, the, the competition isn't the overall concern. It's the individuals coming with that are from all over coming into the community, whereas that space is then designated and designed to keep people safe. It's the the people that come with the competitors oh, yeah. well, that will we filter into the community, which is that something that to be mindful and planning. That's the event itself. All the feedback I heard, like lacrosse, uh, Horschel, the, the event, the competitions are not the concern. It's the people coming with yes. that uh, in mass. That's what is, which is kind of like almost like the the, the wall. So they won't carry you after until like that. Right. I think I can do some things for that because if we establish a start line. Start area and a finish area, spectator area. When you really look at the logic of it, people don't come to Iron Man just randomly. It's all, mm -hmm. it's all visitors who are associated with an athlete mm -hmm. or with a vendor or something like that. So anybody who comes there wants to see their athlete at two spaces primarily, at the start and at the finish. Mm -hmm. 
So the logic being is if we require vaccines or testing, or if we, if we require them to follow the guidelines, you know, into those venues during the normal course of the day when they're outside, they're going to be the people that are vaccinated while they're in the general public and spreading around. So there, I would, I would surmise that that those people that want to come and, and with their entities, when they go outside those venues, outside our venues, they're going to be vaccinated. And it's going to be safer, if not, you know, if not totally covered by all those people who at some point are going to want to go into a venture site. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the logic that we use when we said, when we proposed, because that other, our, our investment have been affected. Mm -hmm. But we're kind of going the other direction where we're saying, hey, we will have a start and a finish venue. Nothing controlled, so you have to show proof of vaccination to get in. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you leave that during the course of the day, or when you're there earlier in the week, mm -hmm. you'll be up, you'll be you'll have your wristband, and basically we'll have more people in town that are vaccinated or somehow. Sure, and, and I think that's the message that needs to get out of us yeah. to, to increase buying from the yeah, community exactly. or alleviate the value of these concerns. I think if we use that logic for people who are saying what about them. Those people aren't coming in just to watch them. They want to see them at the start of the finish. Do you have a protocol in place for the volunteers? Is there going to be vaccination? Yep. Same thing. Volunteers? Yeah, we handle volunteers. They run through our office, and we'll make sure that's covered. So you know, the volunteers will be um, required to have proof of vaccination or testing, whatever the, the, the you guys are requiring from us to do. The same as the athletes, the same as offender, the same as our staff, um, or spectators. Yeah, I, I have to run to a 415 call. I'm awful sorry, but I think that we, we have a system we think can work in place. I think the June event, George, we got to work on to make sure we get the right there. I think it's going to be up to both your organization, as Jason just said, to get the messaging out to all of your attendees. So. It's not only athletes, it's it's vendors, it's spectators, it's family and friends, it's anybody that's coming to it. If they come to a class and race, they better have proof of vaccination. And the local well, media is going to be our citizens know. Right. We're gonna come up with we're gonna come up with a plan to get it out locally too. Once mm -hmm. once we get everybody's uh, support on this, um, is our plan is to get it out real good so people know that we're taking action, action greater than probably any other destination in the country is at this point. So the thing, I just want to go back to, and I know she's going to step out, but Thanks is it just Thank for you. clarity? And I'm not, you know, I'm not, I understand that you say, you know, to go by the high school, uh, you know, guidelines. Are you talking the New York State high school, not our local? I, I don't think if we're in this county, we go by our local. I think I understand what you're saying, but just so you know, that is the that is the guideline. Our local district. I know our place is probably too aware of that. Now that you know, so just I want to put that on the table. So we're not back and forth. Yeah. Again, the um, as I, I mentioned to some of you, lacrosse was misclassified. Well, men's lacrosse was classified as a high risk sport, even though no one ever touches the ball. You know, there's minimal hitting in the game. It's and it's um, the uh, the National Federation of Interscholastics uh, uh, Sports has reclassified it to moderate risk. NCAA has reclassified it. We're trying to get New York State to do it because it's creating this artificial barrier. It shouldn't be here. Right. So I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. That's all. You know, we're all on the same Okay. okay, so you said, I believe that you said 
for the June event, we should go by the guidelines in the state library, not other guidelines that we're setting for today. Well, they're not materially different. The only difference I'm aware of is that there's a requirement to wear a mask under Alvin. No, we're talking about stop vaccination. So you're saying that if they're old enough for the June event, that they'll be back? No. Youth? No, absolutely not. If they're, if they're of age to be vaccinated, 18, currently, 18 and older. The June event, have, the oldest kids are like 14. No, that's all. But they have parents with them and they have. So we're saying all adults who are 18. So, MJ, just to piggyback on what you were saying and just kind of what the feedback of the community is that uh, earlier in the week when you have uh, the, the younger group, yes. they would be generally on Main Street Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and mass. Uh, and if um, if there is a put in your protocol to um, uh, who's going to have oversight over their, you know, their child wearing masks on Main Street, and then um, I understand that from your organization, you kind of have to kind of uh, put it on to the parents to, to have to manage the the, yes. the children to put the mask on. Um, what I guess from my perspective and the communities is that if, that if we see something like that and mass and student like young adults who are not required to be vaccinated and are disregarding the mask mandate, it's going to sour the community I understand. approach. I understand. To events in general. You're and familiar I, with our summit society group. Big course and heads that up. Yeah. And they will be heavily on Main Street. Any hot spot there might be to make sure there are not large groups of unprotected kids or people around, I guarantee you. Okay. And I think that's something that the community would like to know. Yes. Because, uh, and it's unfortunate, but a lot of the responsibility of building trust within the community happens to be with you, our country, because you're one of the first ones Understood. that we're going to be experiencing. Yeah. Because the event itself is out of sight, out of mind, because you're over in the fields. But what we see is, you know, understood. Yeah. I mean, I, I got to be honest, being down there late last year, it was kind of crowded and messy down there. Mm -hmm. There was not much control over that. And the advantage we have is we have groups, yes. better chance of trying to control them. Yeah. It, it took us a little, it, as a village board, we were uh, a little late, but when we got on board with it, we, we started to manage it much more, much better. And you're correct on that. And it just, um, it's unfortunate that just the random tourists from three hours away disregarding the mask. Okay, it's just a tourist, but we're talking about what would be the, the foundation of our community is like the events. And we just want to ensure that, I guess maybe, I don't want to speak for the board, we want to ensure that it gets all on the right foot. Right. And, you are, and you, are, you are the first person out. You're the first one, the first person to the place. So, understand. We did talk about the masks and the playing, and then I went to the vaccines, and now we're not on Main Street. So it did go a little bit. Yeah, yeah. No, we understand completely. And we also understand that the impression that comes out this year is going to be very important to our future. So uh, we're going to do everything in our power. And I think those of you who've worked here for 30 plus years know we do everything we say we're going to do. We do. Mm -hmm. We give our best. We invest in it. There's only so much we can do. We'll do everything we can for the survival of this event. Okay. That's where people will depend on it to live. So. Thank you. It's very important to us. Greg, I have a question for you. The quality of the swim at the Northwood Beach. Um, there's two, two culverts going in the water there. The water's super shallow, it's all muck. And then there's stones along the shore, like that high. How are they going to get out of the water? We, we have a lot of without cutting their legs open and those get, you know, running, trying to get out of the, the shore. Yeah, we have all sorts of systems in place at other events that we can model after that we can use here. We at other places we actually build ramps that we temporarily put in the water when they're running up the ramps. We, we have basically the, the rubber bar mats that we can put to cover over anything that's any protrusions that are outside. Are you of intend on doing that? And we can do that we're like a safety has to yeah. do this. Now we're gonna look at that. I mean those specific details we do that many times a year. So that's not that's not a huge issue. And we'll make it safe because we have to protect our inhabitants. Yeah. So we'll design whatever system that we need, whether it's a whether it's a temporary ramp in there, whether it's mats, whether we uh, whether we drop in some type of uh, carpeting to protect people's feet as they walk up into it. But yeah, that that's um, pretty much. Yeah. So they're going to be running out of the area. They're not yeah. going to be walking and being terrible. Yeah, well, we control them at you know forty nine minutes of that's over the course of the year anyway. So there's no places that are allowed worse than that. Okay. We're trained professionals. <laughs> <laughs> and the question of the active storage, 
Okay, again, we're we're in flux now because we're trying to get contracts from different venues. So we don't really want to let the, get the word out right now, but in general, um, we realize that we have no village parking lot for this summer. And now so no no use at all. So we're looking at moving, and I met with Butch Martin yesterday. We're looking at moving the majority of our non-race activities to the horse show grounds just for that year. So, um, Good. so okay. Athlete registration, merchandise tent, and the Athlete Village, the, you know, the Ironman Village, we have a spot, we have a pretty good setup in mind for the North Shore Council, so we can make that work. But Good. not the village? No. What's your um, We are dropping, numbers are dropping daily because people are deferring so either they're concerned about COVID or they're concerned about the, the, the race to get canceled, so they don't want to be stuck or they're not training. We sold out, you know, we were in the 2000 range when we sold out in 2019, yeah. and we are basically, we're going to hit a 20% reduction very easily based on the withdrawal rate that we have now. You know, if that's, the, if that's what you guys put on us and say, hey, you're going to be at 20%, we'll be, we'll be down to the, yeah. if not lower. So no, we'll kind of be the races of old where we have. But isn't it, Craig, just to clarify, isn't it traditionally the amount of athletes that actually come and participate is about 2,400? Yeah. So, so. It, so it'll be the same thing. You know, you just take that number and you, and you ratio it. So if we traditionally sign up 3,000 and 2,400 show up, if now we're limited to 2,400 that are signed up, you knock down another four or 500 and we'll probably be under 2,000. You know, I can't guarantee it and I can't. I know I'm going to probably get in trouble for throwing numbers out there, but the uh, the numbers are going to be significantly less than we thought. I don't think the community would be upset to be saying that. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, no, you might get a lot of bots from the bus. <laughs> my salary. Any other questions? You know, I just would like to just add, if I could, Mayor, um, you know, some of the points that we want to get here about some of the potential areas of concern. The more of those we know about, the more we can communicate directly. So I think I think sending those ideas along would be really helpful. You know, that's the word of the concerns specifically, so that we can deploy and make sure that those are addressed. Uh, I think again, I don't want to speak for the board. We're not in the business of meeting events not happening. They just want to. We're, we're elected to make sure that they can happen in the community is, is on board and safe with it. However, that looks. Totally. I think the problem is the same. Right? It's the concern of the higher bigger choice. You know, I don't think there's a new place. And I'd like to just echo that. You know, I've, I've lived here almost all my life. And I, um, so I, I, you know, I'm holding two hats. And I totally understand that I'm going to express it. The concern with the conflict, but I think that as much the, the community drive us that the bus being able to bring the, this our event back after a two year hiatus and bringing it back safely and bringing it back as, as a model for our country and even the world because I'm not sure if any other Ironman event that we have on our portfolio is going to provide is going to ask this type of protection uh -huh. and requirements from our athletes and our Volunteers and I think Lake Placid leading the way by being one of the first Ironman events outside of Kona in 1999 and then coming back here and restarting after this COVID, you know, nightmare for the last couple of years. I think that's could be a source of pride as much as anything else. Yeah, and I think if we can demonstrate that we have the community help support us and Anything else? So you you had mentioned you're gonna go back, develop the plan, and then present it. I'm gonna come back with a much more specific plan that will have a little more specific about how we're reducing. Um, you know, it's a little more challenging. We're not dealing with individuals, so mm -hmm. to get to have you know 20 percent. Um, you know, we have to work in divisions and things. So we're going to we'll, we'll have that done in a couple of weeks. And I'll do this workshop. Here's our specific plan. All of August, August, June, we'll get.
I just grabbed off of the uh, like Essex County website. So if there's information wrong, it's probably because it might be and it can easily be fixed and corrected. Um, so you have somewhere that pops up where you can put, you know, like, hey, uh, these are up to date events. For instance, for us for COVID, we can give like a little warning, be like, hey, if you're intending to ride, you need to follow the guidelines that we're setting for all the rides in the area. And 
so this is what it looks like. Um, these are, I'm not sure if I got that stop right, uh, but these are all of the stops. The green bus is where the, that's actually, that should be where the bus is right now. Um, I, I have a, a volunteer who is just driving the route and it, it updates every other 10 or 20 seconds at where the location of the bus is. So during this, while I'm talking, you can watch as the, you know, the bus will move. So that way, if you're at a stop um, up over on Greenwood and you have to schedule and you know that the bus is going to be headed that direction, you can get a better understanding and estimate of where it is. This will let you be able to, you know, to just jump, kind of see whether or not it's worth walking to another stop or walking to, you know, the destination you're trying to get to. And it's a really uh, maybe cheap's not the best way to say it, but it's a really efficient way to do things. It's very inexpensive. Um, I, I did a good deal of research and I ended up connecting with the uh, GIS manager for a city in Mississippi. And this is what they do. Instead of hiring out a, a larger company to uh, build a, uh, a GTFS structured platform, which is like it's either Google or general transit specific format, which I put together a small one for this. I just didn't finish the routing information completely. Um, instead of doing that, what you do is you take a mobile device and using the ArcGIS uh, Esri account that we have, uh, the village has at least, uh, with an addition of, uh, I think it costs $50 uh, to enable tracking of that account. So for instance, if you were gonna create this for the Placid Express, it's a minimum of $350 a year for the ability to load this app onto, for instance, an iPhone or an Android, plug that into the bus. You can set a schedule so it turns on automatically when the bus, you know, when the schedule starts, it turns off when the schedule stops, when they go on breaks, and you just leave it there. It's low maintenance, it's easy to use. Um, the web platform is very modular. It's the same thing that all the other web maps I've put together is hosted on. So we're not responsible for servers. We're not responsible for cloud storage. It is a pretty effective and easy method to kind of keep track of where the you know public transportation is. One of the other things that I I can't even have it so uh, the the names of the lots or the names of the the stops will pop up. And I, I'm working on figuring out a better way for it. But currently, if you click on the bus stops. I have it set so it, it'll pull up the PDF of uh, the actual stops so you can see, you know, just in case if you're at a stop that actually has a physical, uh, like I think the Hanover's has a, uh, a box that has the schedules on it. If it's not there, because someone took the last one, this way instead of having to navigate to the website, um, you can just click on this. And then in addition to that, it is pretty easy to set it up. Uh, you know, I have a link to the Villages website just by default. You can set up so it you can route people to wherever, you know, the information is pertinent. Uh, we could have, it's essentially a really modular platform to kind of inform the public. Yeah. So as a consumer, if I'm waiting for the trolley, am I going to take a picture of a QR code and it's going to download the app and... It's a website essentially so if, so we have to have information on there that says go down to this website or load this website or just use a qr code that they scan and open the website for you it'll format to anyone's phone or mobile device and if you let's just say if you're using uh, i think an iphone you can you can create a short cut on your desktop yep. exactly yes the website mm -hmm. well but you got to remember when we're thinking of consumers mm -hmm. you know so if they're coming out of a hotel they're standing at the high peaks and they want to get down to smoke signals. You know, how are they going to how are they going to find that out? How are they going to know that the bus is coming in five minutes or the bus is coming in 20 minutes? Mm -hmm. Hey, Patrick, it's <laughs> yeah, they could, but... was that uh, Mindy? Hey, it's Kate Thompson. We could also uh, just take it, hang along on Jackie's question. We can also link this into the village and town websites too, right? Because it's just a URL. Yes, yeah, you can put this on, you can integrate it to any website uh, very easily, so yes. 
well, you, you can, but don't make it confusing for the consumer. No, no. Some, Very, some, 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 some you, you to say because you are the expert. You take somebody like me, sitting here going, oh, 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 you know, you don't want that to happen. I mean, at the Golden Air Prairie, you are, when you check in, they can scan it and yep. automatically. Done. Pull it up. Or well, they're going to have to leave a page up that says, otherwise, they're not going to be a national wall. It will be that. No, he's, not, he's, not, he's saying it's, it's less yeah. expensive to go web based than it is to hire a third party to, to yeah. build an app. So you can click on the app and then have it yeah. track. It's kind of this is the low cost way of obtaining yeah. what we've always wanted. It doesn't do any good if people are using it. Yeah. So Pat, but, Pat, 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 it, it will. Like you can create a shortcut on your yeah. on your phone and click on it, and it opens up the web page. How much does it cost to create an app? I hear the. It depends. Depends. I mean, some are Roughly. inexpensive. This could be expensive. Roughly. So I can't give it up to Pat. So Patrick. Yeah. I, I was talking to the IT guys up at Essex County and they're thinking of doing similar things for some of the broader Essex County um, buses. Have you had an opportunity to connect with them to see what they're up to? I believe this was kind of the start off to that. Okay. He's presenting this to us and then he's going to present it to the county. Yep. Gotcha. Because it might be that might be a route to develop the bet. What all towns and cities are doing for this is developing an app that you can put in either the Android or the Apple phone store app store. And then somebody can download it and then use it when they want to. I mean, that's the easiest thing to do, right? But it does take some investment in mobile app development. Well, the benefit of this, yes, yeah. is the best you can do with minimal amount of investment. Well, so even, if you want to go larger, then we have to start. With even like minimal amount of investment, if you have an app, this it, it just it's the best. Because for instance, you're gonna then have to direct people to either you have to make a you know an Android version, you have to make an Apple version, you have to make right. a version that works with every different device in between, so you don't want to you know, marginalize people. The various degrees of but, size. yeah, but this. It's just a website. It can pull up on any device. It can go with Chrome, Safari, whatever. You, a phone can connect to the like the internet. It can open it. Up. Is it accessible via a QR code? Yes, completely. Yep. Okay, that's probably the easiest way to do it. Then. Yeah, it pops up. Okay. Somebody's phone has multiple tabs. It's not. I have yeah. sixteen tabs open on my phone right now, so yeah. you just go find it again yeah. if you stand. Oh, like sixteen, maybe about fifty of them. It's baseball. The the tracking works on your mobile. Heck, I, during the meeting, I was making sure that it was working while things were going on, and you just pull it up. Uh, technically, what it's doing is little auto refreshing every couple of seconds to let you know where the bus is. It's a, almost a fresh job. I was glad to see it got through Main Street quickly. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah that, <laughs> that's one of the other uh, things. It, well, his battery's really low, but um, it, it tells you how fast the bus is going, which is information that doesn't need to be to the public. But what that can do is, if I know how far away it is from the next stop, and we're going to try to get the best way to be like, oh, it's five minutes away from stop A, stop B, stop C. Is it the driver's personal phone? Uh, yeah. It, it is. So we're going to re have to rely on the driver to well, charge well, his phone. That oh, is. Oh, you go buy. Yeah. Oh, okay. All that's right. that's, 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 that's what the problem. Okay. Oh, correct. Yeah, that's a personal phone. So you said three hundred fifty dollars. That per bus. Yes, three hundred fifty per bus. Plus the phone. Plus the phone. Um, and that's pretty much the minimum. And that's. I'd be very confident saying the least expensive implementation of this year I'm going to find. Not to mention the fact that it's, it's kind of done. Um, the thing that's waiting is just the buses to be, you know, activated if you want to think about it. Um, or I guess approved to be activated, why not? And as you say, the county's looking into this, and if they adopt the program and it works for all their yep. buses, they may go with an app somewhere. I mean, this is just a foot in the door, a start, 
Yeah. A good start. I, I think it would, from my perspective, how you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think this would open up or uh, increase a, a demographic usage because it's native to their everyday sort of lives. Yeah. Do, is there another segment that relies on the trolley that we would have to come up with a different avenue that maybe is an older generation that like, it relies on? It? Yes. And but this would in itself open up generally the younger sort of demographic never really used this or didn't use it as often. But uh, anyone who's in a, in a range from middle age down, mm -hmm. the QR code, they have the code, and they just will know. This is where I'm at, this is where it's coming. I can see how it'll increase ridership. Would we want to use this maybe during the world university use? Maybe we want to invest in a standalone map, but that comes with a, a increased cost and continuing cost for maintenance and, and uh, talking about demographics, obviously the Greenwood residents use it the most. Yeah. They're the ones with the limited income and the older generation, the ones that just barely know what a cell phone is. So they'll figure it out all that one. Yeah, well, all they need is one person to figure it out, and they'll all yeah. go to that person. And there's something that we're reading very well because I talked to those at Greenwood and have uh, maybe a third party or a county citizen can donate maybe uh, a TV yeah, and then smart. have and then have literally the app displayed all the time. Right. So they'll know when it comes yeah. well. And it's, it's not changing a lot. the trolley so at this all current time. Yeah. yeah. So they're already using the trolley now, so mm -hmm. you're not changing. Yeah. Yeah. Now this could be an urban legend, but I have heard that there are times, depending upon who the driver is, that to accommodate some riders, they will deviate. Well, yeah. Does that does that happen? It's not urban legend. But we'll be very aware of it now. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that's part of the urban. That's why we can't get on the schedule. Yeah. It's part of it is that they are required. The federal government. Yeah. Very much. If you call in and you need a handicap pickup, you can go to or I'm pretty sure it's any pickup. You, you have to the schedule has more information about the specific. Then speaking of demographics, one of the other things that can be tied into this is um, Esri has a really good uh, survey platform. Uh, so we could have attached to this be like, you know, either on the bus or at a stop, like scan this, fill out a survey. How was your ride? Is there a destination you you know you prefer to go? Uh, how long did you have to wait? You know what was the goal of your ride? So that way we can get that information to be like essentially figure out who's using these and if it's the demographic that we want to be using it, or if there's a demographic of people that we can expand these towards. Underserved one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think to your point, Patrick, too, with the survey. You know, getting an app like this out there and in people's hands to use might also, we can also maybe try it into a campaign to get people to use public transportation more often, especially just given that, you know, we've got some challenges in the next two years on parking lots and et cetera. This might be a way to help just, you know, make um, the area more accessible while all the other activity is taking place. Yeah, exactly. And one of the things that other municipalities have done is kind of add this to, for instance, somewhere that shows where all the parking is. Um, you know, for someone coming out of town, being able to have a clear cut view of like, oh, this is the municipal parking, and then being able to, you know, tap on the icon for the municipal parking, it has all the rates, all the rules, all the times in one quick area, and then have a link to go to the site that actually has more in-depth information regarding to the parking rules and regulations throughout the different seasons. Mm -hmm. Patrick, not to put you on the spot, yep. but could you bring up um, Waterline Main Street? Mm -hmm. uh, like the water map? The water line on Main Street. And the reason I'm doing this is that 12 years ago, we were on the board, we've been collecting GIS information and collecting it and collecting it, never had anything to show for it other than data. And Patrick, for the last year, has been putting it in. I'm going to put him on the spot, but I want him to show you the water line on Main Street. If it's anything like when he downloaded for me, he's going to show you a shutoff that was put in service 30, 30 minutes or an hour ago. Yeah. Did I, did I put you on the spot too? No, no, no. It's just right here. And this isn't 
public, entirely public information yet, but eventually will be. But it's but this is what's coming. This is how yeah. accurate it is. There's um, the water line, correct? Yes. And so, these are all shut offs that have just been put in place, and no, not, not all. Not all. Of, um, what this was done. WordPress oh. at 4:04 the time. The 11th? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was done like four minutes ago. Um, so they added that uh, four or so minutes ago. And there's there's still plenty to do, um, but the Main Street water shutoff map is working out really well. Where as they're going along, they're able to uh, GPS the location of all the different valves, shutoffs, uh, lines, pipes. So that way, in the future, we know where they all are. Uh, we're going to be able to have a, a record of, I mean, same for the electric department. We have electric maps that we're working on getting. Telephone poles. Yeah, electric utility poles, underground, and especially for this uh, Main Street project, it was a, a really good opportunity to really, unfortunately, tear up the Main Street so we can go and get that information as we're putting it into the ground. But I mean, this compares to right now, and I think if you ask for that, there's, we don't know where shutoffs are, we don't know where yeah. lines run, we're running into lines we didn't know were there. This is really going to be state of the art when we're done. And they've made a massive uh, amount of, well, um, see if it will move. Uh, they've made a lot of uh, progress recently just from being able to go out and collect stuff. Uh, let's see if I should turn the valves off. Uh, but yeah, there's there's a lot to to collect and a lot to a lot to deal with, which is always always fun. Yeah, and with this, um, Kim, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you're standardizing a lot of your poles so that when a worker goes out, the same equipment is there, they know what they're running into, or if they, they're going because they have a problem with a pole, they can pull it up on this map, they can actually see a picture of it, they can see what equipment's there, what they might need to bring with them. Yes. I mean, this, when this is all done, it really will be really nice. Yeah, like, yeah, this is running on time. You would search 1007 yeah. SEC 9. This is your favorite, huh? No, this is this keep, keep like you up at night. No. <laughs> <laughs> well. This is one where the pictures have labels on them. You get the trolley schedule. One stop shopping. So if someone had never been here, they could be confused and they pull it up on their map, they can see that okay. customers here. Yeah, and tool are at the top of the scene. So the most of most some of the load out of this is served from land and some is served from actually Buck Island. Yeah, but it's it's definitely work, you know, all the maps are work in progress, but it's a, a progress that is really chugging along and putting us in. I mean uh, some people from Dank were over in the electric office not too long ago. Um, and this is something that not not many municipalities have. Uh, we've definitely catapulted ourselves ahead um, to kind of the forefront where a lot of places should be just by being able to utilize this locational information. And it's something that's developing every day. Like I'm working on um, getting the camp addresses added here for the fire department so they're able to, you know, <coughs> Everything up there is technically 12 uh, Georgian list lane. So right. now they can have an up to date camp address map whenever there's an issue. Or what you're saying, there's a fire and they need. Or exactly, yeah. Right. I mean, you say not a lot of municipalities have this. They were probably like we were a year ago. We had a lot of information, but nothing put into to a map and visualization. Exactly. We've had a presentation with Patrick before, but not when you two have been on the board. Maybe at some point down the road, we can bring you back in and let you 
show yeah, all the good stuff. Yeah, I to get you guys, uh, I guess just everyone, like, login information to view that uh, village map I had up, just like a, the in-house um, GIS viewer of current projects that eventually I'd like to get to a point where we have a public facing platform um, for relative well, information. Um, but yeah, that would, that would be fantastic. Great. Great. Thank you, Patrick. When's the presentation to the county plan when is your I do not know. Yet to be scheduled? Yes. Okay. Um, as soon as they are available, I guess. But Good time. You're like, how busy they are. Yeah. Nice job, Patrick. Thank and uh, thank you again, Patrick. Sure. And Brad, I kind of rushed you before not knowing how long we would be with Iron Man on the cross, but we have a, anything else on Main Street you'd like to update us on? Any questions that came out of the business location meeting? I mean, this would be a great time. You've got Brad here. Um, I didn't bring my notebook, but uh, there were some concerns from a couple of people just uh, with last on Fridays. It's not a concern of mine because I know it's a construction site, but they thought maybe the guys weren't Clean up the way they should on Friday. So Any sense of very so yeah. Basically, it looks like a construction zone. <laughs> like it is. Right, exactly. Yeah. I, didn't, I, I thought we were up. I mean, we were there Friday. We, we, we had the Elgin up there. We went up and down the street. We moved all the plates. We opened up as much parking as we possibly could. There's no way that they can have it. Like, it's not a construction zone for the weekends. So they just have to be told. You know, we can't just sugarcoat it with them. They have to be told that, or it's just going to keep coming back to that same thing. Uh, uh, I did get feedback saying that you there has been spraying down and sweeping more often. Yeah, we're going to be by Mother Nature. Nature. Uh, uh, so seems like Mother Nature has sprayed us down. Oh, uh, oh yeah, I'll wait, but I would say that is a positive. Yeah, we, um, we've been up there a lot. And Jason's been out communicating with businesses and people. I guess we need to be keeping that communication up. Like I said, I didn't have a phone at the moment, but I said I would bring it up. Yeah, I wouldn't touch it. And I feel like I felt the same way as I'm feeling. I'm like, we're going to have to kind of get used to it. <laughs> this, is, yes. this is going to be here for a little while, and I know it's not ideal, and I know that we don't want, you know, distributors and so on. Like, so, like, but. Uh, we're going to have to go through some growing things. Well, one of the things we stuff. found when we first started, we did start moving some of this a little further back, but then we were having issues the next day. Because once you make it look like it's not a construction zone, then it's the next day we have to fight for three hours to make it become a construction zone again. So Sunday that's, there was a white Mercedes going it, down it, it's, uh, the other way. It's very, it's very it's difficult to. Mm -hmm. Also, especially the ditch line and stuff like that. There's just no way that it can be. We can't bring in hot. We, I mean, they don't even have the asphalt plant open yet to even start paving some of these in. So, um, some of it we're, we can clean up as much as we possibly can. And other than that, it's just going to be once the end of June gets here. And I could be. That was the question of what is it going to look like at the end of June? Uh, everything will be off the main street. Oh, hard 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 hard. I think it's what they can. It will be a hard service. It will be paved back in. So, I'll buy your phone. Really and I think it's safe to say from <clears> the <throat> construction meetings I've been at, they kind of are intimating that this, the worst of it is the beginning. Well, the worst of it is this year. Yeah, yeah, every, right. every year is going to get easier. And I would imagine even in the fall, it'll be easier than this spring. I mean, the water line was a big. Well, yes. Yeah. But we are behind a little bit on the water line. Uh, still, I say due to snow. Services are going to be. Longer than the water made itself. Services okay. are going to take longer. And that's the next phase. So be yeah. That's already started, right? They started. The <clears throat> high peaks went on the new water line. They should be just about finished with that. High peaks will be the first one on the section of 16 inch that's in service from Age Street to number one. A couple other things. Uh, we had a couple of changes that we had to add. One is the uh, Sanitary sewer line up Saranac Avenue. That's going to have to be relocated because it's in the way of the drainage. And also, the water main up there we found is in extremely poor condition. So, we're going to have to extend the water main from number one to uh, Elm Street. 
we're going to upsize it from six to 12. It wasn't in the plan to do that, but after running into a few unseen things up there and then seeing the condition, it's crazy if we don't get it out from under our construction. We don't want to be tearing it up for the next five years. No, that's, that's our main concern, especially in that intersection. Where is that again, Brad? Where number did you? One, from number one, Main to Elm Street. Okay, thank you. But other than that, uh, pretty much a lot of the drainage work is done. Uh, the one unit in number one park, there is water running to that unit now. Uh, that drain that used to always overflow on Elm Street, that will no longer, it's connected now. So that will no longer happen. Nothing will run out of there at the end of Elm Street. So there's been a lot of positive things that have but uh, we are still a long ways from <laughs> seeing a huge, huge making progress. Yeah, yeah that's great. Brad, did they connect the old drain, the overflow drain, that one main, or did they put a new overflow drain? No, it goes from the uh, infiltration unit into the more tech unit, and now it's like it did before. It's just like this. Yes. And can I um, suggest something? When uh, the guys, when next time we hit a water ramp mm -hmm. and they open up the valve, can they do it slowly? Yeah, it was slowly. You know, because the pressure, water pressure blows stuff apart. It's, it's very, very slowly open. Yeah, it's air pressure they grab the problem, but not water. And I guess that goes back to, and we had talked about it before, you know, we talked about push notifications like the attacks. So, like, if the water was shot out of my building, I would shut off the water at my building until it's turned back on, and then I would turn it on slowly. Because I burst it like one of the apartments too when it came back up. But the, that's the only issue with that is everything that's been done has been an emergency at that one moment. moment. Yeah, so when it goes off, that's fine. I get attacks, the water's off. Great. So I'm going to shut off the water my main to my building and wait for it to come back on and control it. Yes, that's, 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 but that's not us. I mean, if you were to have water, you know there's a problem. So you could you could shut it off independently. Yeah, I know before it gets shut off. Yeah. But we you knew. Had, it, had to shut water off. I mean, you only have to go over it. Right. We we do we're almost at 200 subscribers now for the um, daily construction forecast update. Um, we do have the ability, both Haley and I, to push out a really quick email. It takes literally maybe five minutes to write it and then send it. So if if there is a situation where there does need to be a really quick notification, we can use the MailChimp or email platform we have going forward for the in the meantime. And I appreciate that. I think, you know, this day and age, I think people aren't checking their email. So, you know, it's a text that comes through on your phone. Water's off, water's back on. And I think at some point just striving for that. Um, for emergency situations. Well, the issue up there is Peter was there. I mean, by the time we would have got a notification, the air was back up. That's how fast that yeah. last night. Yeah. I mean, literally, how long was it off? It couldn't have been off more than 20 minutes. Maybe. Yeah, I was in the woods. <laughs> yeah, see, that's what I mean. Even if you got the notification, you wouldn't have been able to get there. Right. Anything. So that's the one that worked about was backwards. Yeah. That's, that was the last one that happened. That was the only one that would have affected it. It was kind of like that. Um, but I mean, we can, we, we hopefully will have less and less of these as we go down this end of Main Street. Um, I think we've run into just about everything that we could so far. Which is par for the course. Yeah. The last one. But uh, as far as turning it on, it's turned on slow. That's what we had a fire hydrant open before it was even turned on. So that's just air trapped in your building that's gotten it. If they open up all their taps as they're opening up, would that help get rid of the air and the yeah. air damming? Yeah. yeah. But the, you got to, the issue is, is if you're not there and you didn't know what was off, you open the line. Right. It starts blowing air. And normally, what somebody does, first reaction is to slam it shut. And that's what causes it to blow something. Um, do you, I, I got this and I got an update that's now not starting yesterday, but the 17th. 17th. Um, do you want to just mention that to the group? 
that's the paving that's going, the work yeah. that's going to be done from I guess it would have start at Elm Street and go uh, the first phase is going to go from Elm Street to just past Price Chopper and then it's going to switch to Nightworth from Price Chopper out so they can do the joints in the concrete basically from Elm Street to Price Chopper is going to be a, just mill a couple inch a few inches off and put a few inches back and then the rest of the way out it's just the joints in the concrete and then an overlay so that's gonna that is scheduled to start the 17th so the 17th when they have well it's gonna be a joy <laughs> should, well, go no, pretty, should go pretty quick oh, yeah. two ways to look at it it's, it's, it's around, either a around. inconvenience or we're lucky to get the work done i think it's the lucky to get the work done yeah oh, no, it, it would definitely be grateful but the, the thing that's going to be in one of our benefits is it's the same contractor we have working with Main Street that have that disruption okay. right. so. And also, if I'm not mistaken, the reason they're doing the day work from Elm Street to Price Chopper and then night work beyond is just so that the motels along the way and the people there aren't being kept up at night. That was part of it. And also uh, the reduced traffic that they're going to have to deal with with cutting those joints in the concrete crossing the road. Okay, um, yes, right. Because they're going to basically be crossing the road, not staying in a lane and being right. wrapped around. They're going to go to each joint and actually physically chop out a chunk of that concrete to try to prevent those heaves from coming back. Do you know what he's talking about? The speed bumps, like once you pass a price chopper before you get to the entrance old military road, and there's cement under there. And in the past, they tried to repair it one way that didn't work. Now they're going to go and cut a gap and try to keep it from working. And that paving eventually is all the way to the second place. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's the second time we've done that in the last decade, I don't think. Maybe it's good. Kay Jones is on board at that time. That was atrocious. They did it in 2005 when they did Main Street. Uh, they paved it out to just not past Carolyn Road, and then they did that overlay maybe four years ago. Okay. Oh, they are over to the click, and then they just paved it again. <laughs> portions of it they just did last year, the year before, maybe. The year before. And this ties in with all the structure and drainage work they did last year, correct? They actually have a they have a few things on Saranac Avenue that they're going to be coming in. Sounds like next week and repairing one of them is uh, right across from there. That new eye doctor is. They have to fix a collapse in the road right there. Starting next week. Shouldn't be cool. It should be quick. Other than that, that's all I have. Anybody else? Oh, I need to remind you. Sheila Preston's request. Yeah, we're working on okay. a request from Sheila Preston, who wondered if a pickleball court could be added at the tennis courts. And at this point, I don't have an answer on that, as that was a donation to the school and through the village. We may have a contract and we need to keep it, but we're looking into whether we do or don't. I've actually handed it off to the uh, Development Commission, Kelly Green, okay. and Janet Bliss is looking into it as well with a contract. But if we can accommodate it, we will. But if we can't, it's a good suggestion. We try it on. Okay. And she reached out to me as well. Just a, a fence. Uh, it is. If it's growing smart, I just, um, I remember it was a donation. The donation was especially so that the school would have a place to hold tournaments. And if it interferes with that, well, we'll just have to see if, 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 if it can be both uses. Mm -hmm. I wonder if it, I don't know. So is it a restriping of the tennis court? It, it might, I think it might be a restriping. Just a striping. I know that they just play in elementary school. Yeah, at night, yeah, yeah. Thursdays, Wednesdays. It's a, yeah. It's possible. So let's hope it works out. Yeah. Carol Dawn. It's not Carol Dawn. She donated like 80 grand. Yeah. It was a, a substantial donation. Wow. And then the dad and family. So I. There's a lot of things. I'm sure. Anybody else? We kept this one shorter than the last one. A good train going. <laughs> well, thank you very much.